Well, good morning, everyone. It's Palm Sunday, and probably everywhere around the Christian world, people are talking about Jesus' triumphant entry into the city of David um, the week before his death, um, sacrifice for our sin and our redemption, our rescue uh, from sin and death. And um, our reading series um, provides us a, maybe a different way to look at that, um, entry into the city. If you did the reading this week, um, it presents, 1 Kings chapter 8 presents the dedication of the temple. After Solomon had finished its construction, he had fulfilled his father's uh, dream of building a permanent temple in the city of Jerusalem, where all the people could worship God um, there and Solomon finished that remarkable um, work in seven years, which is a testament to the amount of wealth that he had, that he could dedicate to building that. Um, and he timed the dedication of the temple um, to two festivals, two celebrations, two holy events, and the calendar that um, ancient Jews followed, um, Yom Kippur and Sukkoth. And now maybe you don't um, obsess about ancient Jewish rituals and practices and don't spend that much time talking about them, but the first one, Yom Kippur, is the annual remembrance of uh, atonement. Um, the nation observed it by fasting um, and reflecting on the previous year. Um, maybe it's a little different than we do. We, we do New Year's and we think about all the things we want to change in our life and all of the things that we probably won't follow through on. They were supposed to reflect on how they had not met God's expectation, not followed the law, and then rededicate themselves to that. And then Succoth is the next one that follows, sometimes referred to as the Feast of uh, Tabernacles. It is a remembrance of God's deliverance uh, from Egypt. Um, it remembers the time living in the wilderness, following his deliverance um, as they waited to enter the promised land. Um, it also celebrates the tabernacle as the center of religious worship, because if you remember your Old Testament stories, the tabernacle is set up in the middle and all of the people camp around the tabernacle so that they would all have access to God's presence. And that tabernacle reminded them that God's presence was always with them and that he was the one leading them. Um, and how they celebrated the Feast of Tabernacles is they would build a structure, a booth. Um, it had no walls, but they placed palm branches on the roof to symbolize the shelter and protection that God had provided to them. So um, Jewish history tells us something a little bit interesting about this dedication of the temple, these two events. Solomon decreed that they would not fast. There was no fasting for this Day of Atonement this time. And he turned that into a two-week-long celebration culminating in the arrival of the ark to the temple. And so if you read that this week, there's a whole lot of stuff happening in that story. Um, but I wonder, as I paused and thought about Solomon messing with tradition, he's messing with 500 years of tradition to tell people not to observe something the way that they have been doing. And uh, people like their traditions, right? Sean and I moved pews this morning. Did you move pews this morning, or did you walk into the same seat you like every week? Now imagine taking a 500-year tradition and decreeing, nope, not this year, no fasting, no reflection on atonement that way. Solomon had transformed that into the sacrifice, the submission, the fasting doesn't invite God's blessing. It's God's faithfulness and grace alone that invites God's blessing. And then he decreed that they would do the festival of tabernacles this time, celebrating this permanent dwelling place that he had established 
um, for God to then move into and experience the blessing of having him permanently among the people. Um, can you imagine if, if you were all of a sudden told that have you been doing something for 500 years wasn't going to be the way you'd do it anymore? Um, but I think there's a moment that um, this change helps us understand something. I don't, we don't often think about Solomon being a prophet, but the text we read this week actually proclaims that he is a prophet speaking prophetically for the Lord. And so maybe um, Solomon helps set the stage uh, for our understanding of something that Jesus said. Do you remember this? The Pharisees confronted him and his disciples because he doesn't fast. And Jesus' response to them was, can you make the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? See, Solomon is, is understanding, I think, a deeper truth. How, how could you fast when you know you're in the presence of God, who has invited you to feast at his table, who has provided everything that you need? And Jesus basically is pulling that same idea, saying, there's going to be a time when you are going to fast because I'm not going to be with you. But while I'm present among you, it's not a time for fasting, putting ash on your head or solemnness. It's a time of celebration. And so that's what Solomon did in transforming Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast of Tabernacles. He was saying God is with us, so his blessings are ever present. And so he invited the people to celebrate that. Here's the text from 1 Kings chapter 8. When all the elders of Israel had arrived, the priests took up the ark, and they brought up the ark of the Lord, and the tent of meeting, and all the sacred furnishings in it. The priests and the Levites carried them up, and King Solomon and the entire assembly of Israel that was gathered about him were before the ark, sacrificing so many sheep and cattle that they could not be recorded or counted. The priests then brought the ark of the Lord's covenant to its place in the inner sanctuary of the temple, the most holy place, and put it beneath the wings of the cherubim. The cherubim spread their wings over the place of the ark and overshadowed the ark and its carrying poles. These poles were so long that their ends could be seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but not from outside the holy place. And they are still there today. There was nothing in the ark except the two stone tablets that Moses had placed in it at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites after they came out of Egypt. When the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled his temple. Then Solomon said, The Lord has said that he would dwell in a dark cloud, I have indeed built a magnificent temple for you, a place for you to dwell forever. Now, we probably pause right here and go, God doesn't live in a temple. So that thought dreamt into your head, God's not in that cloud. God doesn't dwell in a temple. I, I do think there are moments when our insistence on what we already know is right, that we miss what's actually happening. But this time, Solomon agrees with you. He knows that that isn't possible for God to dwell in this stone temple. And so he says, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Yet give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy, Lord my God. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence this day. May your eyes be open toward this temple night and day, this place of which you said, my name shall be there, so that you will hear the prayer your servant prays toward this place. Hear the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel 
when they pray toward this place, hear from heaven, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. It would seem Solomon understands that God doesn't dwell in the cloud. His being isn't inside that temple. But he does seem to understand that the manifestation, the sign of that cloud, is a fulfillment of God's promise to hear, to be with, to be present among. His presence is so powerful that the priests are pushed out. The ones who are supposed to serve him because he doesn't need the service. There's nothing that we have that can somehow be of use to a God beyond our imagination. But I love the idea that Solomon prays and says, always keep your eyes on this place. And when your servants pray, hear from heaven and forgive. This temple provided the opportunity for the Israelites to seek God's forgiveness for their sin. But Solomon knew that it wasn't the sacrifices. Somehow he knew it wasn't fulfilling the ritual that allowed God to forgive them. It was instead God's faithfulness. And that the prayer, the petitions, the supplication, all of it is not based upon the one praying. It's based on the one hearing. And Solomon knew that God could never be contained in a cloud or a building or anything else for that matter. He can't be trapped in wood or stone, bronze or gold. And as amazing as the ark is, as beautiful an object as it probably was, it does not contain God. He is a God unlike any other. He is not manipulated or controlled. And the sacrifices don't force God to do anything. It's really just this simple request. Please hear us, Lord, and forgive us our sin. The sacrifice, the fasting of Yom Kippur did not cleanse oneself. How in 24 hours could you cleanse yourself of sin? It's impossible. The observance of the ritual did not entitle one to be forgiven by God. The observance was a simple invitation, a supplication. I know everything I need comes from you. And what I need is forgiveness for my sin. And asking God to do that is an appeal based upon his mercy, his love. It is not based upon the worthiness of the worshiper. And the Feast of Tabernacles reminded the Israelites that it was God's favor, God's favor alone that rescued them from slavery. It was not because they needed God to see their worthiness that caused him to save them. It was because he remembered his promises. And the tabernacle represented the idea that he was always with them. No matter where they went, God was present. And they always had access to his blessings. Not long ago, I was reading an article that really stunned my brain. It was about um, palm branches used in ancient Jewish practices. Apparently, I've seen too many movies, or maybe it's because I lived in San Diego with palm trees and they're just everywhere. Apparently, palm trees are present in ancient Israel. They're just not as plentiful as our imagination assumes. And so it made me pause and wonder, well, where did they get all the palm branches for all of these festivals? And even this moment in scripture where Jesus is greeted and they wave palm branches and lay them down. If they're not just everywhere, where do they come from? And you'll have to forgive this um, crude metaphor. Um, my mom used the same Christmas tree for about 20 years. Every year it went up 
And then it came down and went back in its box. And my dad hauled it off to storage. Over and over again, that Christmas tree was used. And apparently, if you're an ancient Jew, observing the festival of tabernacles, you're using palm branches that you saved from the year before, and the year before, and the year before, and that maybe your parents used, and you're preserving them because they are actually a scarce resource. Now, that idea does not match every discussion around the world today of these palm branches of people just grabbing them up off the streets, pulling them off the branches, and waving these luscious green. No. They're thatched roofs, brown branches, waving, falling apart. Because even our best falls apart in the presence of God. These symbols were generational. Can you imagine? We didn't save the Christmas tree, honey. Maybe we should have. I don't know. But could you imagine if you were turning to your children and placing the palm branches that you would help your parents place? the significance of understanding that our need for God, the protection and shelter that he provides to us, is more than just for us. It is for everyone, for all time. To observe the, tabern the Feast of Tabernacles took preparation. Over and over again, the same symbols used. But when Jesus entered the city, it's a remarkable image to change it a little bit and see that he is our protection and our shelter. That's what he's here to do, is to save us. He's fulfilling so many of the images that we find in the Old Testament, but because we're so familiar with what we already know, sometimes we don't see we don't notice what God is doing. And maybe if we pause for just a moment, we can connect these two um, events. The moving of the Ark of the Covenant into the temple and the entry of Jesus into the city of Jerusalem. There's something that Solomon said that caught my attention in 1 Kings chapter 8. The Lord has kept the promise he made. I have succeeded David, my father, and now I sit on the throne of Israel, just as the Lord promised. And I have built the temple for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. I have provided a place there for the ark, in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with our ancestors when he brought them out of Egypt. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in front of the whole assembly of Israel, spread out his hands towards heaven and said, Lord, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth below. You who keep your covenant of love with your servants who continue wholeheartedly in your way. I have to have us jump back to Deuteronomy chapter 10 to take care of a controversy. At that time, the Lord said to me, this is Moses, chisel out two stone tablets like the first ones and come up to me on the mountain. Also make a wooden ark. I will write on the tablets the words that were on the first tablet, which you broke. Then you are to put them in the ark. Yes, God wrote them. That's what the text says. That these were stone tablets, unlike the first ones, I guess. But it was still God's word. He still wrote it. He still did the carving. And they placed those tablets inside the ark. And Solomon refers to this ark as not containing God, but containing the covenant of the Lord. 
the one that he had made with the people of Israel. Now, that is very interesting to me, especially when I read this very familiar passage from Luke 22. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Now, maybe I'm a little too interested in this preposition than I should be, but there is something remarkable. My imagination is captivated by the use of in, in my blood, in the ark. There is a remarkable substitutionary atonement that is taking place. That's the term that I learned when I was little, substitutionary. I don't even know that I knew what it meant. Substitutionary atonement. But I want us to think about it from just a slightly different perspective. Jesus fulfills the law. Now, that is a big statement. That statement alone could be a 12-week sermon series. How does Jesus fulfill the law? So I'm just going to have to quickly summarize. Jesus is the only human being that has ever actually kept the law. He is without sin. He fulfills the law. You and I, not so much. We carry in us condemnation, death, because of our sin. Paul calls that the body of death, the fleshly nature that is prone to sin. The law teaches, it instructs us so that we might see our sin, feel our shame and understand our helpless state. We are unable to fulfill the law, to keep the law. But here's the remarkable thing. If you will just indulge me for a minute as I try to be somewhat poetic in the discussion, it's because sometimes we need to capture our imagination and try to put words and text and meaning together. Jesus, the Word, one with God, God, became flesh. He dwelt. John uses a seldom used word, tabernacled. He tabernacled among us. The God who could not be contained in a temple took up residency among us, covered in flesh. He carried within himself the perfect righteousness of God because he is God. He fulfilled the law. He kept the commands. He lived a perfect life, sinless. And then the cosmic switcheroo, that term is Latin for God's miracle of Trump, it's not, but it is a switcheroo. What you think God is here to do, He is not here to do. And what you think is going to happen to you, it's not going to happen to you. Because you see, Jesus takes our sin. 1 Peter 2. He Himself bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. There's that little preposition again. In. The one who is God, tabernacling among us, Jesus places our sin in his body. He becomes the ark of God, carrying not words that condemn us, 
That's what the first one did. This one, instead, he himself carries our sin in his body, the sin that condemns us. He puts that body, his body, carrying our sin to death. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. Jesus bears our sin, and God, through Jesus, kills it. But God isn't done. Jesus' resurrection fulfills the promise of God to give us new life. It is the power of Jesus' resurrected life that we carry within us. And that life, that power in us, is what continues to defeat sin. But more importantly, it empowers us to live a life of obedience to God. The Spirit prompts us not just to reject sin. I, I think this is a fundamental struggle in Christianity, that we think our job is to say no to sin. Our job is to say yes to God. And there is a huge distinction between that. Because just saying no to sin does not bring about the fulfillment of the law of Christ. The fulfillment of the law of Christ is doing good for God, not because it somehow saves you. It's because you are saved and you carry within you the one who is good. And I want you to pause for a moment today when the triumphant entry of Jesus is being celebrated. Is it, the world remembers Jesus entering the city of David. And I want to ask you if you can remember. We need better holidays, I think. If you can remember the day Jesus entered your life. Do you remember the day that he conquered sin? That he defeated the powers that held you captive? And he released you from bondage? It is very confusing to live in this world where we think we are constantly held captive. We are not. We are set free. And I think we need to pause and remember that this is a celebration. Solomon was right. It's a celebration. If you're in the presence of God and the blood of Jesus covers you and your sin has been killed and the only thing at work within you is the power of God, then how could you do anything other than celebrate? And I know when we come to the table, so often we're convicted by our shortcomings. Yeah. But the sacrifice is so much greater than anything you've ever done. It's so much more powerful because it is the actual body of Christ who was carrying your sin and he killed it. He canceled your debt. I guarantee if all of your debts were canceled right now, you'd be very happy people. Well, your greatest debt has already been canceled. And when we take the cup, we're remembering the blood. Only Luke uses the language he did, by the way. Only in Luke does Jesus say, Covenant in my blood. The blood 
And the cup that we drink reminds us of the price that was paid and the sin that was forgiven, but it also reminds us of the power of life present in us, the blood of Christ. And it compels us not to weep again, but to celebrate the life that God has given us. And unlike a temple built of stone, as marvelous as it was, this promise of God, His presence, is eternal. It is with you always. And you always have access to the power of God present in you because of the one who makes the promise, not because of how worthy you are. Let's pray together for the bread. Father, we thank you for the life of Jesus. We thank you that he carried in himself our sin and that he willingly sacrificed his life to pay for our sin and to destroy our debt. Father, we pray that as we take it, you would help us to be remembering, to be always before you, present, remembering that we carry within us the power of life, the power of Christ. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Let's pray together for the cup. Father, we thank you for the blood of Christ, for the covenant that you have made with us, for the promise that you would not only save us, but be present with us and return to take us home. We thank you for this cup that reminds us of the gift that we have been given. And we pray that you would help us to look for opportunity to do good, to glorify your name, to reveal the character and quality of Christ that you have placed within us. It's in his name we pray. Amen.